Good morning. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, thank you, Maricor, Serve Minnesota. Uh, to Kathy, Lisa, thank you for the invitation, an opportunity to be with you uh, all as part of the proceedings today. Uh, it's really an honor and a privilege. I always love coming back to Minnesota. Uh, I started off here in my journey um, uh, in the United States 29 years ago, 27 years ago, uh, and my first stop was Minnesota. Um, so I stayed because of Minnesota, and um, uh, it, it was uh, it was a great uh, a great time. And I do remember the. Um, uh, there was a friend actually uh, visiting from Texas, and he'd heard about how tough the Minnesotans were. And we were out, in, I think it was in February, um, driving around just north of the Twin Cities. And um, we saw this guy in his shorts and T-shirts out on a lake, uh, <laughs> sawing through the ice with one of those big saws with the big handles. And uh, so my friend from Texas, he said, you know, because he'd heard how, how tough the Minnesotans were. And he said, boy, he said, he shouted to this guy, he said, I've heard the Minnesotans were tough, he said, but this is unbelievable. Uh, he said, and this guy shouted back, he said, you think I'm tough? He said, my brother's on the other end of this saw. <laughs> um, so definitely tough. Um, and we definitely have a tough, uh, a tough problem to, to, to address um, uh, with, with both the opioid epidemic, really in the midst of an ongoing public health crisis, an endemic problem with alcohol and other drug uh, disorders. Uh, in the United States, it's not just a US problem. This is a problem, a global problem, in middle and high income countries uh, around the world. What I want to do today is kind of give you a, uh, a kind of a broad overview. I will delve into uh, a, a little bit, some detail in different aspects of what we've learned about addiction about the clinical course of addiction, about the recovery process. Uh, we're coming up for 50 years, actually, since 1970, since the war on drugs was declared. Uh, that was a, a, a kind of a, a quote-unquote war, or a concerted, really the first concerted uh, intensive focus to address addiction in the United States. And uh, it focused both on supply reduction, of course, but also on demand reduction. Uh, as a result of that, we saw the birth of NIAAA, NIDA, SAMHSA, CSAT, um, ONDCP, all of these offices, federal agencies and offices, which came about, which were appropriated, funding appropriated to support research uh, and, uh, and help address these uh, endemic uh, problems. So I will talk a little bit about what we've learned over this period uh, based on the research and what we're learning now, really in the last 25 years of neuroscience and recovery research. Uh, to do with addiction. Just want to give you a heads up. This is an institute I started a few years back, and we publish a free monthly bulletin. This is donor-funded, uh, and you can sign up uh, at recoveryanswers.org, uh, and that website also has a lot of free available information uh, to the general public, uh, as well as clinicians, administrators, policymakers um, on uh, addiction, treatment, recovery, and recovery support services. So what have we learned about addiction um, in this last 50 years? We've learned a lot. We've learned a lot from um, epidemiology, about the etiology, about different typologies, the clinical course, and about uh, treatment and recovery. We, have, we describe addiction as a chronic illness. I'm sure you've heard it described as a chronic illness, not an acute condition. Uh, however, most of our uh, treatment system has been geared towards still addressing addiction, unfortunately, as an acute care condition, even though we've talked about it as a chronic condition. This highlights uh, really the chronic clinical course of, of addiction. We know that roughly it takes about four to five years after the onset of a substance use disorder, that's an alcohol or drug use disorder, before someone starts seeking specialty care. Now, during that time, of course, people are trying to cut down, they're trying to stop. There's a lot of stigma, discrimination, shame, and fear associated with acknowledging, disclosing uh, these problems, of course, in our society. So people try to keep it hidden. It takes about four to five years after the onset before people start seeking specialty care. What's also noteworthy is after people start seeking specialty care, on average, in adult samples, it takes roughly eight years of... Um, treatment and uh, relapse and, and short-term remission before people get one year of full sustained remission uh, and about four to five treatment episodes on average. 
before people get uh, one year of full sustained remission. The good news is most of those days are abstinent days after that initial exposure to treatment. So people might get three months of abstinence, have a relapse, might get, and then get six months, have a relapse. They tend to get longer and longer periods. We see this with opioid use disorder, alcohol use disorder, other kinds of substance use disorders. When you follow people up over time, people are making progress in their recovery until they get that one year of full sustained remission. But what's also noteworthy here is that it takes another four to five years of continuous remission before the risk of meeting criteria for substance use disorder in the following year drops below 15%. Why 15%? Because 15% is the annual risk in the general population. So to be no more likely than anybody else of meeting criteria for a substance use disorder in the next year, if you've already had it, takes about four to five years of continuous remission. So what does that suggest? It suggests that this is a disorder which is susceptible to relapse as people begin to change their behavior. Again, these are averages. Uh, and also, after people achieve that very important milestone of that one year of, of sustained remission, still takes about four to five years of continuous remission to be no more likely than anybody else out there of meeting criteria for a substance use disorder in the next year. The other thing that we've learned is that addiction is actually, compared to other psychiatric illnesses, a good prognosis disorder. 60% plus actually achieve remission. Uh, so this doesn't discount, of course, the tragedies that we hear about and the deaths we hear about uh, every single day. This is also a killer illness, a deadly illness, and we're all too aware of that every day we hear that in the news, and about a 1,000 families are bereaved each and every week just from opioid overdose. That's what we're seeing right now. But um, there is good news in, this, in, in, in the sense that most people do achieve remission who have this disorder. One of the issues that we have struggled with is the evaluation of addiction treatment. So one of the things that has happened is we've been held to a different standard in part because we have tended to really focus our efforts on acute stabilization in a kind of a rehab type setting of, 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 of a few weeks of intensive treatment and discharge. And this really highlights a kind of the difference, uh, a different way that other treatments of chronic illnesses are evaluated. If we compare addiction, which is a chronic illness, to something like hypertension, an FDA approval for a medication, for example, for hypertension follows this logic. People come in uh, with high degrees of hypertension, they have high blood pressure. If you can show that when you administer the treatment, the symptoms go down or people get into remission, and then when you take away the treatment, they return. That's evidence that the treatment is working, okay? Let's take addiction. People come in, high level symptomology of, of, of addiction. You administer the treatment, it goes, goes down, people get into remission, take away the treatment, symptoms come back. That's evidence of treatment failure, that the treatment doesn't work. The exact opposite of what might be expected when you're talking about a chronic illness, but not if you're talking about an acute illness, right? So this is part of the problem, is that we have tended to frame addiction and our kind of our, our cultural psyche is biased, has been biased towards the short-term, acute, intensive stabilization without proper attention to uh, the ongoing nature of uh, uh, care. I liken it to kind of a, like a burning building. So we recognize there's an emergency situation, so we want to put out the fire. So we, we put out the fire, and we can cheer that the fire is out. But the problem is, is that we have done a good job at stabilization, putting the fire out, but we've done a less good job at preventing it from restarting again. So, uh, and part of the issue has been the lack of architectural planning needed to help rebuild, and also the recovery resources, the building materials, that people need to rebuild a gutted building or a gutted life. The other thing that's been a challenge is granting what I call rebuilding permits or building permits. I assume anytime you want to build something here in Minnesota, you have to get a building permit, right? Uh, but what do we do with people with addiction? We tend to uh, prevent them from rebuilding their life by not giving them the proper permits. Can't get a job, can't get a loan, uh, can't open a bank account because of prior criminal records. So these are the barriers that stymie people's progress in their ability to get a foothold in recovery. The other thing that we have learned a lot in the last 25 years of neuroscience, 
is that addiction is a genetically influenced disease of the brain that affects these neuro circuits of reward, memory, motivation, impulse control, and judgment. All of these neuro circuits are often radically impaired in people with moderate to severe substance use disorder. And these functional circuits help explain this damage to these functional circuits uh, as the brain tries to cope with this abnormally higher level of stimulus and neurotransmission, uh, but not only functionally, structurally. You don't have to look long or hard to understand uh, that here's someone with uh, alcohol addiction, someone who's a moderate drinker, uh, uh, what, that, that there is damage here. Now, as a trained scientist, I know that this hole is bigger than this one over here. <laughs> and this is what we call, in neuroscience, not ideal. And, but the point is here is that uh, these are not subtle effects. And when we scratch our head or get frustrated uh, or confused by people who would repeatedly go out and use alcohol or drugs despite the severe harm, and we, we're perplexed and we say, why would this person do this? There is obviously some kind of malfunction that has gone on in the brain. And now with neuroimaging, uh, uh, both structural and functioning, we're able to understand uh, exactly the nature of these deficits in the brain, which uh, prevent people from regulating that impulse to use, despite often horrific consequences. The other thing that we have uh, discovered in terms of long-term remission and recovery is that there are neuroendocrine and, and, and changes in, in the neuroendocrine system as well as in the brain. And these manifest in early recovery, in the early months and sometimes years of recovery, as elevated stress hormones, corticotropin releasing factor, cortisol, as well as diminished ability to experience reward. And this occurs as a function of chronic exposure to substances. The reward system is downregulated because of the overstimulation from abnormally high levels of reward. Uh, it takes a long time for these to reverse, recalibrate, and change. This is a study that we have done, a nationally representative study. And uh, just to show you a few highlights of some of the data that we've collected, um, we're looking at um, uh, people in recovery. So these are people who have resolved a significant alcohol or other drug problem. And when we look at their clinical, at their, at their recovery trajectories and course over time, this is what we see. These are zero to 40 years people in recovery from an alcohol or other drug use disorder. And these are the indices of quality of life and recovery capital. You can think of recovery capital as recovery resource availability that someone has available to them to support their recovery attempt. These are more obvious things like quality of life, that's functional uh, quality of life, ability to do things, as well as happiness, uh, psychological distress, and self-esteem. What we see is a substantial increase in the early years, up to about five years, we see a very steep increase in these uh, elements of, of quality of life and positive well-being, and a decrease uh, in psychological distress. However, what's very noteworthy is when you look, zoom in, and look at the, let's look at the first two years, again, what we see is actually a drop in that first, after about the first few months, we see a drop in quality of life, happiness, and self-esteem in that first period of recovery before it starts to increase at about one year. So, and we see recovery capital going up. Psychological distress actually increases in that first year. And quality of life and happiness and self-esteem drops despite people being in recovery. So this makes it very hard in that, uh, in that early period where the bubble bursts. This is what I think is happening here, is that people kind of awaken from this haze, and they're in that first year. After a few months, it starts to hit them exactly what they've got to contend with. And this is what I'm talking about, about that, that burning building. The fire is out. But things are smoldering, and where's the architect? Where's the building materials? Where are the rebuilding permits? And this is what people need uh, to start to begin to, to get a foothold in recovery. Uh, another thing, when we look at different drugs, we find that some, again, on average, 
Some people who, who are using primary substances, different primary substances, have different degrees of uh, deficit. And what was noteworthy in this analysis was when we looked at quality of life and recovery capital, we see those with primary opioid use disorder and primary stimulant use disorder, methamphetamine, crack cocaine, at a substantial disadvantage for the first couple, two or three years. It takes two or three years for people with opioids and methamphetamine amphetamine use to catch up to people who are starting off in recovery with other primary substances such as alcohol and cannabis, again on average. Uh, and both in terms of recovery capital, it takes about two to three years for them to catch up. So they're at a distinct disadvantage early on in recovery. The other group uh, that were particularly disadvantaged we found over time were people who are not in these main ethnic racial groups, white, Hispanic, or black. So these are Native Americans, other uh, minorities that are not categorized in these other major groups. And what we see in, these, in this particular group is unstable recovery, that their deficits in terms of happiness actually going down over time, uh, quality of life going down over time, psychological distress remaining high and even increasing uh, for these very disadvantaged uh, uh, groups uh, of individuals. So stress, increased elevated stress, and, in, in, and a, a diminished ability to perceive a reward. This has been studied for a long time, since the 1950s. We're all familiar today with stress and how our work life or other aspects can actually in, influence physical health. Hans Seeley was someone who studied this. He, he, his his uh, research uh, using uh, animal models, but uh, developed this general adaptation syndrome. He found that stressing an animal would actually cause disease and actually kill the animal. If you stressed it enough, you could actually kill an animal. And he developed this model of alarm resistance exhaustion. And I think this model fits well with addiction. If you think about the alarming events which often precipitate a cessation attempt, there's an arrest, there's an argument, there's some getting kicked out of the house uh, that produces resistance. I'm going to give up. I'm not going to do this anymore. I promise this is the last time. People hold on, they can hold on for a little bit, sometimes days, weeks, sometimes months, but then what happens? There is a period of exhaustion, the people, uh, they cave in and return to substance use. We have known for a long time that these major precursors to relapse, cues, stress, and substance exposure are the main precursors to relapse. So what do we try and do when treatment and recovery support services? We want to try and offset this, these pathways to relapse by providing treatment and recovery support services that can help mitigate these pathways. These are condition cues, people, places, and things which become strongly associated with substance use, stress, as I mentioned, and then priming doses of a substance, a little bit of a drug, one drink, one joint, one line, one hit uh, can kindle craving and increase the propensity and probability of relapse. So providing treatment and recovery support services, what we have found is that doing so actually changes people's social networks, their psychological, their cognitive apparatus, as well as their biology and neurobiology. There have been a number beyond formal treatment or intensive uh, care of stabilization, there have been a number of recovery support services that have emerged and grown. Someone mentioned people power. I think people power is key. Audrey mentioned this earlier. That word, people power. People power uh, and social networks are extremely potent, powerful uh, mobilizers of behavior change and make environments that are conducive and supportive to long-term recovery. And really all of these different facets of these recovery support services are based in people power. I'm going to talk about each one of these in more detail. But first I'm going to tell a little story. So a father gifts his son some land on which the son builds a house. And the son is very happy that he's got a place to live and some land. After a while, he looks out the front door of the house and he sees this tree. And he notices the tree isn't doing too well. He notices it used to bear fruit and it doesn't anymore. The leaves have fallen off and it's not doing too well. But then he remembers over the hill, there's a place where the trees are doing really well. They're green, they're, they've got lots of foliage, and they're bearing fruit. So he digs up the tree, 
and he moves it across the hill into the valley on the other side of the hill. And lo and behold, the tree starts to do really well. It, it becomes full with foliage and begins to bear fruit, and the man is very happy. So after a while, when the tree begins to do very well, he decides now it's time to dig up the tree and replant it back in front of his house. And what he notices is when he does that, he, the tree begins to lose its leaves and to not bear fruit any longer. So what's the moral of the story here? Yes, we can attend to the organism itself. That is important. Uh, we can address certain things within the organism. But the organism in context, the nutrients, the environment is also very key. And this is why changing the soil of communities, the culture of communities, the availability, the environment, availability of recovery resources and the environmental um, aspects can be very key. We have, we have find both in the onset and the offset of substance use disorder. So we talk about things like jobs, friends, houses, recovery residences, sober living. Now, how do these fit into this idea of a disease of the brain? Shouldn't we have stethoscopes, white copes, and be injecting medicines? All those are important uh, for helping people to stabilize and getting to recovery. But what about these other factors? Could actually getting a job, having friends, living in a safe environment actually change the brain? Could it change those, regu those uh, dopamine receptors uh, that are down-regulated early in recovery? Could that accelerate the up-regulation? Could, could it reduce stress levels in people? What do we know? So there's a couple of, I think, very landmark and important studies that can inform uh, our understanding of why it's important to provide recovery support services to support long-term recovery. Here's a a, a PET study, a positron emission tomography study, where they're able to look into the metabolism in the brain of healthy human volunteers. And what they wanted to do here was to look at the correlation, the relationship between social status, social support, and dopamine uh, D2 and D3 receptors. What they found, uh, the question was, is there, does, does your social status characterized by your ability to navigate the environment and have access to resources and social support, the number of people who are, you have friends with. Does that correlate with a higher degree of these dopamine D2 and D3 receptors? Because higher, higher uh, rates of these receptors in the brain are actually protective against substance use. So I wanted to see if you have more friends and you have a higher social status uh, characterized by greater accessibility to resources, do you actually have also higher levels of these receptors? Very strong relationship between um, uh, social status and the density of these receptors and also social support and density. These are about 0.7 uh, in terms of a correlation coefficient. You can see the relationship is quite strong. But of course, we don't know in this study the direction of causation. It could be that just people who, who have these receptors to begin with are more likely to have the higher social status and more friends um, versus the other way around. So what do we know? Well, there was a study that was done not in humans but in primates where they were ab actually able to manipulate the environment and show a difference in the degree to which the receptors were changed. And what they found was they actually had um, uh, primates um, individually housed. And when they measured, again, the do dopamine D2, D3 receptor levels in these in, uh, primates when they're individually housed, there was no difference in any of the, among these different uh, uh, monkeys when they were individually housed. Then they put them, after about 18 months, they put them into troops. And monkeys like to be together, just like we do. Um, and they were hanging out with one another in their group housing. And they naturally start to gravitate towards subordinate monkeys and, and um, uh, uh, dominant monkeys and subordinate monkeys. What they found is that when the monkeys became socially housed, they started to show a difference in their dopamine D2 receptor system. In fact, the, uh, the, the dominant monkeys had a substantial increase 
in their dopamine receptor levels relative to the subordinate monkeys. Which means, translated, is that the dominance was defined as having easy access to food, water, and be able to social, socially navigate through the, the troop. So I think the implications here are that facilitating greater access to and availability of recovery capital may instill hope, empower people, help them have more control over their environment, which I think is key, increase social contact and social mobility through the environment, and thereby induce neurochemical changes that reduces relapse risk. The other thing I didn't mention is that these were all exposed to cocaine. Those who were group housed, who became dominant monkeys, who had the increase in D2 receptors, far less likely to use cocaine than the subordinate monkeys who had lower levels of dopamine D2 receptors. When we think about our clinical pathology, our clinical assessments in treatment facilities, what do we do? We often just focus purely on the pathology, on getting a detailed history, clinical history of symptoms, onset, uh, complexity, intensity. Uh, but I want to just make a point about addressing these other aspects that I'm talking about. So if we take an example, here are two 30-year-old men. They enter treatment with clinically identical levels of opioid and addiction, opioid and alcohol severity. Identical levels of medical problems, psychiatric distress. Now, because they look identical on their clinical profile, they, they're given the same interventions. But what about the flip side of the coin? One of these individuals who look identical in terms of their pathology is from a neighborhood that has a high crime, crime rate, drug and alcohol related arrests. Uh, he didn't graduate high school, has a father with active alcohol use disorder with whom he lives, and is unemployed with a criminal record. The other man, identical clinically, is from a low crime neighborhood, is married with two children, supportive family, has a master's degree, in, and is employed as an engineer with a good job and income. And his father has 17 years of sobriety in AA. Now, how often do we actually focus intensively on these other aspects of recovery resources and recovery capital? We have this focus documented, for example, in the ASAM patient placement criteria, but I don't think we do this very often, actually look at the flip side of the coin in terms of, again, building materials, building resources, and rebuilding permits to move from a treatment plan to a recovery plan. And this really just is a model that highlights uh, the reciprocity between um, remission and recovery capital. This is a bicyclical relationship which is mediated by the reduction in stress. So if we, can, if we can supply people with greater recovery capital, greater resources, we can actually increase the longevity and rates of remission by reducing this biopsychosocial stress. We've known this implicitly for a long time, that addiction recovery is extraordinarily demanding. It's very, very difficult, not impossible, very difficult to change these very powerfully ingrained uh, behaviors. Um, so how have, we, how have we done it? The oldest, perhaps, coming from, again from the grassroots, is from people who experienced addiction themselves, mutual help organizations probably the grandfather of recovery management, AA, NA, groups like that. These 12-step groups started in the 30s. There are many others now, Life Ring, Smart Recovery, which have come about either inspired by or in opposition to 12-step groups, but still the same ideas uh, of mutual support over time, indigenous, ubiquitous, local community resources which are conducive and supportive to recovery, which are highly cost-effective. Based on the research, there's been a lot of research in this area, this model of people power, again, it's peer recovery coaching has started to take off. Uh, it's kind of the buzzword you hear all the time, recovery coaches, right? Uh, we hear this a lot now. Uh, we're starting to begin to study and look at the impact. We have studies from mutual help uh, uh, work, but uh, this is starting to take off. Where I work in Massachusetts General Hospital, we have uh, a dozen recovery coaches working with clinical teams in the hospital to link patients. These are peers, peers in recovery, part of the clinical team that link patients to community resources to get them linked. This is often one of the things where we fail, is failing to make that connection between an acute care episode and linking them to resources that can support the recovery. Uh, 
sober living environments, so uh, recovery residences, clinical models of long-term recovery management, recovery community centers. We're starting now to get data on the public health and clinical utility of recovery community centers. We're doing the first study now in New England. Uh, of those, and then recovery supports in educational settings. These are recovery high schools and collegiate recovery programs. Uh, when we think about people power also, and social networks, which are really inherent in all of these recovery support services, uh, we know that they, the therapeutic elements inherent in many of these social networks uh, are the same as the kinds of therapeutic factors which are common in group therapy theory. This sense of belonging or universality, the sense of helping somebody else helps yourself, seeing other people recover, witnessing that instills hope, imparting information, cohesiveness, existential factors, meaning and purpose, and imitative behavior, seeing how people recover. We've done four different studies uh, looking at what people get out of 12-step groups and other mutual help groups uh, for parents with opioid-addicted children, for example. And what we find, the first two factors that always emerge when we ask people, what do you like best or what do you get most out of your experience in AA, NA, or this group that helps you with, uh, with your son or daughter's addiction to opioids? Across the board, we find the first two factors are universality and cohesiveness and installation of hope. The, feel, the feeling like I belong here, there are other people who have suffered this the same as me, and that I can change, I can get better, I can cope with this. I like to use this uh, lyric by uh, Tracy Chapman. Some of you know that song, Fast Car. It was a big hit. Was it in the 90s? She went to my, my undergrad school in Tufts, so I knew her. Uh, but she says in that song, and your arm felt nice around my shoulder, and I felt like I belonged, and I felt like I could be someone. And I think those two lines capture many of the elements, belonging and the sense of hope that I could actually be someone in the future. I'm not talking uh, a famous person, but actually just get a good job to be somebody, uh, in, to, to get respect in the community. So what have we learned uh, in terms of the evidence base for these different recovery support services? We've just completed a systematic review of all of these different areas for SAMHSA. We were contracted uh, by SAMHSA to do this, and we're, we're going down next month to, to have a technical expert panel. They're going to be publishing it later this year. But we actually looked at all of these different recovery support services and what we've learned scientifically and then what we need to know which is a lot. We still need to know a lot about, about these different entities, but we've learned also a lot. The biggest one, as I mentioned, and the one we know most about, are groups like AA and NA in particular. In the last, in the last 25 years since the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences called explicitly for more research on AA because of its influence, public health influence and clinical influence, uh, there's been a lot of funding uh, from NIH and the Department of Veterans Affairs, which has supported research into looking at AA and treatments called 12-step facilitation treatments designed to engage people with these free, ubiquitous, indigenous community resources. Uh, there have been now a couple of dozen randomized controlled trials um, in different formats um, as standalone therapies, integrated therapies, part of multi-group therapies and as modular appendages. And uh, what we have found is that 12-step facilitation treatments often produce significantly better outcomes relative to active comparison conditions like cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, although 12-step facilitation is not AA itself, its beneficial ex uh, effects are explained by AA involvement in post-treatment. So when we do mediational analysis to understand why is it that 12-step facilitations seem to be doing a better job and producing better outcomes relative to kind of the gold standard, which is CBT, it is because 12-step facilitation is successful at getting people linked into AA in the community, round the corner from where they live. And how does that help? This is what we've uncovered also in terms of the mechanisms of behavior change through which AA confers benefit. So how does AA work? It mobilizes changes in people's social networks. It helps them drop 
drug using, alcohol using individuals and adopt abstainers into their network. It helps to boost cognitive and behavioral coping skills, self-efficacy, which is confidence in people's ability to stay abstinent under various conditions when experiencing negative affect or social risks. It reduces craving and impulsivity. It enhances and maintains motivation over time. It boosts spirituality, which can help people to reframe stress and cope with stresses in different ways. And these are the ways that we have found that AA confers benefit. So these are the same kinds of mechanisms which are mobilized by formal treatment. Except AA and NA and groups like that are able to do that for free in the community over the long term, round the corner from where people live. So this is a... I call this the kind of the closest thing in public health we have to a free lunch because we're able, if we can get people involved in these free indigenous resources, they mobilize these therapeutic factors which help people sustain remission over time. And here's an example of uh, the ability of these resources to uh, help patients sustain remission. Uh, this is what we see over and over again. We're just doing a Cochrane review right now, which is a systematic, rigorous systematic review of AA research, uh, which will be out later this spring. Um, but one of the things we see consistently in all of these studies that we've looked at is this relationship between 12-step facilitation and higher rates of remission. So in Project MATCH, which was a big randomized controlled trial, the biggest of its kind ever undertaken, which was treating alcohol addiction in outpatients, um, what they found when they compared it to CBT and motivational interviewing, uh, into, and a motivational interviewing intervention, was that at, at the end of one year, the relative benefit of 12-step facilitation, 71% more patients were in remission at one year who were treated with 12-step compared to MET, 60% more patients compared to CBT. At three years, there were 50% more patients who were completely abstinent at the three-year mark compared to CBT. <coughs> there were no difference in the continuous outcomes. So when we want patients to get in remission, which is obviously a goal for people with addiction problems, 12-step facilitation actually does a very good job at helping individuals to sustain that over time. The other thing that we're interested in is cost effectiveness. So when we look at studies that have compared interventions, these are residential treatment facilities that link patients, assertively link patients to AA and NA in the community versus those that don't do that very much, what we find is that programs that do do that get patients involved in these free community resources Whereas programs that don't do that tend to have higher costs because they get people involved in professional resources. Now, professional, nothing wrong with professional resources, but in terms of cost, uh, uh, there's a big difference. What they did in this study in the VA had 10 programs, five 12 step, five CBT, followed them up for two years. Those in 12 step had one third higher rates of abstinence relative to CBT, again, had the bigger uh, continuous abstinence measures. Otherwise, there was no difference in the psychiatric or other medical outcomes, uh, but at a cost savings of roughly $8,000 per patient, so they had better outcomes at a lower cost. Now, if you just translate that in just to in, the, in those 10 programs, that's a savings of about $10 million across those two years, across those 10 programs. That is a significant saving um, that, uh, uh, that we're all very interested in because we want to find a way that's both effective and cost effective from a public health standpoint when we've got very high, high volume, high burden diseases, top public health problem in the country. We're looking for that kind of double whammy. Now, this has influenced these, these many, many studies, dozens of studies that have been done on groups like AA and NA have informed this model of recovery peer coaching, which has taken off. It's the idea of uh, that wounded healer or someone who is in recovery can have that conversation, can be a role model and support to someone and help them link uh, to uh, resources in the community. Um, there was uh, a very profound study which uh, kind of informs this. We haven't got a lot of data on this yet, despite its popularity and adoption around the country. But there's one famous study which was actually done a long time ago where they had this peer connection idea uh, well established and they tested it out. And they randomized people leaving treatment to either a standard referral 
to mutual help groups like NA and AA versus a, a systematic referral, which included linkage with a peer, okay? And this is the idea was to get them linked into, into commu these community groups. So they randomized half the patients into the standard care, which was basically, you know, here's a meeting list. We'd like you to go to meetings. We think it's a good idea. It's going to help you in your recovery versus that again. Plus, we'd like you to get on the phone with a current active peer, talk to them, and arrange to go to a meeting. Okay. When they looked at one month just to see how many patients had gone to the, the meetings in that first month, nobody went in the systematic encouragement, encouragement in, in, the, in the standard referral group. Again, these were people who'd never, who'd never been before, so they were naive to 12-step to groups. Every single person went when they were connected to a peer. In fact, they went to roughly three meetings in that first month. Okay, so the difference, very, very stark in terms of having a warm handoff with a peer, the people power, connection to connective tissue there, uh, allowing people to get uh, 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 connected to the environment. We know that pa pa patients who do that have better outcomes at a lower cost to society. What about sober living environments? Uh, there have now been some very good studies funded by the NIH that have looked at sober living environments. And this is one randomized controlled trial where they randomized patients uh, after an intensive phase of care to either standard follow-up versus residential, standard outpatient, go live at home, get your usual outpatient treatment uh, for two years versus get the usual outpatient treatment but live in a sober living environment. Okay, so these were Oxford houses, which are peer-run, small groups of eight, roughly eight people living together, self-governing, peer-run. What they found was Half as many individuals across this two-year period uh, were using substances compared to usual care, 50% more likely to be employed, and one -third, uh, only one-third the reincarceration rate for those who, who are in the outpatient arm. Again, a randomized experimental study. Also cost-effective. Again, we see this benefit in terms of cost-effectiveness, roughly about a $30,000 savings for people assigned at random to live in the sober uh, living environment. So again, this is the kind of double whammy that we're looking for. We're looking for a better effect at a lower cost. And many of these recovery support services we're finding provide that. What about clinical models of, uh, of recovery management? We have talked about addiction as a chronic illness for a long time, but we have actually very few long-term uh, studies. This is one. Uh, that actually was done by Michael Dennis and Christy Scott at Chestnut Health Systems in Illinois. This was done actually in Chicago. Um, but they randomly assigned patients to really be treated much like you would treat hypertension or diabetes or other chronic illnesses versus usual standard care for addiction treatment, okay, after an intensive uh, stabilization treatment. And they followed them every quarter for four years. So every quarter for four years, they got an assessment. Half the patients just got the assessment without any feedback or conversation with a, with, a, with a care provider. And half the patients that were randomly assigned got the assessment, but based on the fact the assessment, they got some feedback. If they were doing poorly or had relapsed, or at risk of relapse, the linkage manager would try and get them back into treatment. About an hour to an hour and a half assessment, feedback, and conversation. What they found is just this one hour conversation, assessment, feedback got people back into treatment who needed it three years earlier than patients who just got the assessment and uh, care as usual. Three years earlier, they were able to get them back into treatment for those who just got the conversation with an attempt to link patients back into treatment. In fact, of the 18 variables that they looked at which predicted re-entry into treatment for those who needed it, the only variable that predicted re-entry was whether they got the recovery management checkup the conversation, in other words. Again, this is not rocket science. This is just treating it like an, a, a chronic illness, helping people to get back into care if they need it. Again, cost effective. When they looked at the cost effectiveness of it, they found it's also good value for money to do this. What about recovery community centers? These are indigenous uh, local hubs of recovery support in the hearts of communities that uh, can provide recovery support. They're not, residential, they're not residences, they're not residential facilities. They're just where, places where people can go. They can learn how to put together a CV, get a cover letter. Um, they can uh, get support from a recovery coach, another peer in recovery. They can attend recovery support meetings. Um, 
They can get linkages to employers who will take people with criminal records. They're growing all over the United States. We're just finishing up the first study uh, of this. Um, this is where they're being referred from. About half have primary opioid. The other big one is alcohol uh, in terms of people who are using them. Um, we're just coming to the end of this first big uh, study of this uh, Hopefully, we'll have the data out later this year on these recovery community centers. Um, and then the final thing I just want to mention is recovery supports in educational uh, settings. So uh, we know that education is associated with installation of hope for a better future. Uh, it also is associated with longevity, period. So just if you have better education, you tend to actually just have a longer life as well as a better quality of life and less disability uh, uh, in your life. So uh, when people, uh, you know, one of the big aspects of recovery capital, I think, is education, being able for, able, for people to, able to get back into, into high school, finish their high school diploma, go to college, uh, which can be a high-risk environment for many people, uh, and they're afraid to go back. So having these resources available uh, can really help people get a foothold in recovery. Um, the, uh, there's been one study we're actually trying to, we just submitted another grant, we have to resubmit uh, to NIDA to look at a bigger study of recovery high schools, but Andy Finch and Paul Moberg and colleagues have been studying recovery high schools for quite a while, again, showing good positive benefit. These are kids who, adolescents who are going into treatment and then coming out, either going back to a regular high school or going to a recovery high school. <laughs> You have these here in Minnesota, uh, and I think Minnesota was one of the states that was actually included in this trial. And again, these are good effect sizes. So for, for adolescents who um, uh, had gone to a recovery high school after treatment versus regular high school, were four times more likely than non-recovery high school students to report complete abstinence. They had better abstinence from, from alcohol and drugs, uh, less absenteeism also in, in terms of their academic uh, attendance. In collegiate uh, in colleges around the country, again, this is another kind of in vogue uh, aspect of recovery support services. It's one I think that we can feel very good about, uh, is that when people get into recovery to help them get back, get their foot in the door of getting a higher degree uh, that they can use to further their life. Again, building recovery capital. Uh, these are starting to be um, evaluated also uh, around the country. We don't have any randomized controlled trials on these, uh, high quality data in that regard. But what we are seeing is that in these high risk environments, we have much lower than expected relapse rates uh, compared to people not in college settings who have the same level of severity of disorder. So, um, I will, I think I'll end there, because it's 10.30, I think that was, that was my time is up, and I know we're going to have a panel and all, and uh, uh, I've kind of fired a lot of information at you there. Uh, I hope we can have some time for, for questions and answers in the panel. Thank you for having me, and for the opportunity to come and talk to you. Thank you.